Good evening. Welcome everyone to the second webinar of the fall 2023 series sponsored by Newton Conservators. My name is Beth Wilkinson and I'll be moderator of this virtual event tonight. Barbara Bates is our technical director. As many of you know, Newton Conservators is an all volunteer nonprofit established in 1961. We connect people to open space, work to preserve and to maintain open space in Newton. Our members and our board are grateful for the beauty and sustenance that the land provides for humans and the other creatures with whom we share the earth. We acknowledge the Massachusetts stewardship of this land that kept its ecological communities vibrant, strong, and interconnected for thousands of years and hope to work with them as we strive to maintain and restore our open spaces. Tonight's presentation is by Lisa Kumpf and Robert Kearns of the Charles River Watershed Association, and they will explain why the Watertown Dam should be removed. I had the pleasure of hearing them talk at a tour of the dam on Tuesday, and I can guarantee that we're in for a real treat tonight and that we'll all learn a lot. We're really fortunate that they're here to share their knowledge with us. Welcome to both of you, Lisa and Robert, and Robert, you're going to start us off. Yes, and thank you so much, Beth, Barbara, and everybody at Newton Conservatives for having us here tonight. We're really excited to talk about um, Watertown Dam and the exciting opportunity for not only Watertown, but Newton and other communities up and down the river. Uh, first of all, I want to introduce myself. I'm Robert Kearns. I am the uh, Watershed Restoration Specialist at Sierra Degree. I just got a new title from Climate Resilience. Um, and, and I'm here with my colleague, Lisa Kampf. I'm really excited to talk about Watertown Dam and also sort of talk about dams in Massachusetts and in the Charles River watershed in general. Um, we usually start out our presentations similar to you all at Newton Conservatives with the land acknowledgement. And I just want to uh, humbly recognize that the, the land that the Charles River watershed uh, is on resides on occupied territory, traditional territory of the Massachusetts Wampanoag and Nipmuc nations, and just want to acknowledge them as past, present, and future caretakers of the land. And we are committed to uh, creating respectful engagements and relationships with indigenous communities in our watershed to learn, uplift, and support their relationships and wants with the river and the land. And I just wanted to, it, I, I know some of y'all may be familiar with the Charles River Watershed Association, but if you're not, we are a nonprofit organization founded in 1965 by a group of residents who um, didn't have the conventional wisdom that the river couldn't be cleaned up. There's, there's been a lot of history of pollution in the Charles, and we've come a long way since the song Dirty Water, but there's still a lot of work to be done. We have an inter interdisciplinary staff with attorneys, um, organizers, scientists, um, policy folks, all different walks of life. And we have uh, different program areas, including river science, river restoration, which we're talking about today, as well as stormwater solutions, kind resilience, and education and outreach. And for, for our presentation, today, we're just gonna start off with an introduction, uh, talk about the Charles River watershed and dam um, story. Then I'll transition it to Lisa to talk more about the history of Watertown Dam and the feasibility study that was concluded a couple of years ago in 2021 as well. And then I'll talk a little bit more about sort of the engagement that we've been doing in Watertown and surrounding communities and the next steps um, for the project. So just to give some, some big context, Massachusetts is really dammed. Um, in the Commonwealth, we have over... 3,000 dams, uh, many of which are relics of the past and don't serve any purposes, similar to Watertown Dam. Um, and in the past 12 years, 60 dams in Massachusetts have been removed, opening up over 300 miles of river um, and creating 13 jobs for every $1 million spent. It's really an economic driver. And this map here on the right um, shows uh, all of the regulated dams, so the ones that are um, regulated by the Office of Dam Safety and by the hazard classification um, from high hazard to uh, non-jurisdictional and low hazard. Um, the red are the, the more hazardous for life and property. Um, 
And when we're thinking about these dams, uh, I just want to give some context. We all know the climate is changing, um, but here in the Northeast, we're really seeing a, a lot of increase in precipitation and inland flooding. Like we're seeing out in Lemonster uh, a few weeks ago, um, a lot of those storms that are seeing a lot of water in a short amount of time, that is what we're unfortunately going to be seeing more so in the future. And what we've unfortunately seen in some places like Vermont, as well as Lemonster. Um, and a lot of this infrastructure, like dams, culverts, uh, you know, parking lots, like I, I've heard, so, uh, you know, I saw the pictures out in Newton from a storm this past summer, you know, they're not designed for this increased amount of water. And it's just really going to um, be intensified by our strongest storms with climate change. And, and these are just some pictures of some of the past instances of flooding in 2010 impacts the Moody Street Dam on the right. You can see the water going right over the dam. A lot of times people think about the picture on the right, which is sea level rise and, and coastal storms, but you know, the inland's also going to see a lot of flooding too. And in the Charles River, we have a really rich history of fisheries. And um, you know, if you go back before uh, colonial contact in, in the rivers like the Charles, all up and down the East Coast. In the springtime, when the herring would come, you could walk. You know, they said it, the rivers were on black with fish, and you could pretty much walk across the river um, on the backs of fish. There were so many of them. And, you know, before the dams were constructed in, in the Charles, there's a history of these fisheries getting all the way up to Natick and beyond. And, and the image on the right shows a Home rule petition from the town in Natick from 1795 that was talking about regulating the shad in the herring fishery. Um, additionally, we have uh, records of Atlantic salmon, a uh, species that's now uh, pretty much gone from the Charles River that were going all the way up into Rentham, into a tributary. That, that really blows my mind, all the way up from Boston Harbor um, in Eagle Brook. Also, um, a nearby Watertown, the Free Library, they have historical records from their um, herring wardens. And all the towns, including Newton, historically had wardens and, and folks that would regulate the fishery um, from the city level. And historically, and today, the fish would spawn in tributaries of the Charles River, um, including Beaver, Chester Brooks, and Waltham nearby, um, as well as... Uh, other tributaries up and down the river. And we really would love to see those fisheries um, to be restored through ac actions like removing the dam. And then I just want to highlight this really important point that, um, you know, that ties into our land acknowledgement. These dams have been opposed for hundreds of years by the indigenous people um, in our watershed. In the Massachusetts nation originally had a fish weir at the site. So they had a you know, it was it was a fishing net made out of uh, wooden sticks, essentially. And this was because this was the head of tide with the harbor. The salt water would come all the way up into Watertown Square, right below Watertown Dam area um, during high tide. And one of the first acts of the colonists were to um, put a dam on this historic fishing site and traditional fishing site. Um, to build mills. And the Natick Nipmuc um, Indigenous people petitioned the Commonwealth of Massachusetts in 1735, the state legislature um, to, or the colonial legislature to, you know, the impacts of the, the these dams on fisheries and really oppose them starting back then. In this paper here, which um, is a part of our River Interrupted uh, story map, has information all about this history of these dams being a impact to the um, critical food source for the indigenous peoples and are really a, a direct legacy of the colonization. And you may be wondering, so what are the fish that come up um, and migrate from the ocean into the river and back to the ocean and vice versa in the Charles and other uh, coastal rivers and streams in, in Massachusetts and New England? Um, in the Charles, we have rainbow smelts, which is the one smaller fish here on the left. We have American eel, 
uh, American Shad, Alewife, and Blueback Herring, uh, which are also known as River Herring. Um, the eels, they they are unique where they're called catagomous fish, which means as the, when they're adults, they live in the river and the ponds and lakes, um, like the Childs River um, and the tributaries. And they actually go as adults to the Sagasso Sea and Bermuda Triangle to spawn. And the babies come up with the um, with the Gulf Stream and come up to the rivers like the Charles River um, and then grow as adults. The other fish here, the smelt, the shad, and the herring, um, and alewife, they all live as adults in the ocean and then they come up into the freshwater rivers to spawn. So it's really exciting every year. Um, you can go down to Watertown Dam and other places along the river and see these fish come back. And they're really an inspiring story of, you know, going against the current, a new year, a new beginning. So they're, it's really cool. And they know the crazy thing too, is they know they have like sort of internal GPS to be able to know, to get back to the river they were born, which is, which blows our mind. Some of them, a small number of them do try other streams, but majority go back to where they were born and they know to do that. And you may be wondering, okay, we see dams all over Massachusetts. You know, Robert, you said that the state's dammed. Are these dams really causing a problem? I mean, they've been here hundreds of years. We hear often, you know, hasn't the ecology, you know, evolved with the dams? Unfortunately, the dams are bad for the environment. Um, when we think about rivers, the Charles River is over 14,000 years old. You know, you think about the glaciers retreating, the river and the ecology, the, the, the plants, animals, the fish, they all evolved over thousands of years. And this dam was here, you know, a couple hundred years. It's a blip in that. So um, these dams are really uh, causing impacts to our our um, wildlife and, and the health of our river. Upstream of the dams, we see higher temperatures, low dissolved oxygen impacting the health in, of the water, the water quality. Um you know, stagnant water, the sediments um, accumulate there with the slow slowing of the water. And we see oftentimes uh, invasive plants growing in in the aquatic, you know, in, in the water column. Downstream, we see more erosion, you know, the fish passage can be blocked or also be impacted um, and the thermal pollution from that heat upstream. You may be wondering, can we just you know, stick a ladder on and solve the problem. And, and at, at the uh, Walk of Monday, Hartman, one of our indigenous partners was saying, fish don't know how to climb up ladders. I thought that was, that was a good quote. But essentially, if you build a fish ladder, it, it can help a little bit. But all of these other issues with, with water quality and the health of the river are still there if you just slap on a ladder on, on um, a uh, a dam. And also think of it like this. It's, uh, you know, they're not designed for every species. So the one at Watertown Dam has, Lisa will go into this more, but it doesn't pass all the fish that, that want to get up and down. Um, it's just a big wall in the middle of a river. And also it's putting all these fish into a small area. It's sort of like the analogy I like to think about it. It's like you're taking all the fish and wildlife and sticking it through a straw. You know, if, if the river is, you know, a large area you see you're making them go through a straw to get through um so yeah by removing the dam you're really restoring the river and and if you go to a dam removal site and if you didn't know where the dam was uh before you got there you wouldn't you couldn't tell where it is it, it was before you know so that that's a good thing like we went up to um another dam removal site now I was surprised. I'm like, okay, where was the dam? You, you can't, you, you shouldn't be able to tell after a project's done. Um, another thing I just want to highlight, I know that a lot of people are recreational users of the river, myself included. A lot of these dams, including Watertown Dam, are called low head dams, which means that if you go over them in a paddle or if you fall in or go in swimming, um, at certain flows downstream, there is a um, drowning machine, they call it, where there's a hydraulic where people can get trapped to drown. So there's a big effort nationwide to look at identifying where these low head dams are and put up more signage and uh, where where it makes sense removing them. 
so just want to highlight that it's they, they can be a hazard for folks um, at certain flows. So definitely stay away from inside the water um, by them. Um, context. What about, you know, I talked about the state. What about here in Massachusetts? We have a lot of, or, or here in the, the Charles River. In, Ma in the Charles River, we have over 108 dams that are regulated by the state. And, you know, we're doing field work and we still find smaller ones too that are less than six feet. We were on Laundry Brook uh, last year. We found a teeny one, you know, when we were looking at a culvert. It's kind of crazy. Um, the majority of them are privately owned. And just after that, they're owned by, um, you know, cities and towns. And um, after that, you know, 26% are owned by the Commonwealth. So the majority of the Commonwealth owned dams in the Charles River are in, um, you know, below the Natick Dam. Um, also, when we're talking about, you know, the hazard potential, the majority of them in the watershed are significant hazard potential dams. Um, and we also have data, not in this presentation, but we also are, are looking into sort of the condition of them. And a lot of them are in poor or unsafe condition. You may be wondering, you know, historically, the fish were able to get up to, you know, Natick and beyond. Where can they get to now? Here in 2023, the, the, the furthest extent for the river herring, well, I'm talking about the shad, the alewife and the bluebacks, they can only get up to Route 9 and the Circular Dam. They're, at past this, at the Circular Dam and the Silk Mill Dam, there are, which are both in Newton, obviously, there's no fish passage at all, no fish ladder, no, no, nothing there. Um, and upstream of that, the other dams generally don't either. So this is the farthest extent they can currently get. The eels, on the other hand, they can slither up and over the dam so that I've, we, we caught them up in Dover. So the eels can get farther, but, um, you know, the, the other fish, they can't get past here. Um, and we have uh, fish passage from the Gridley locks. The, the fish come in in the spring, they come in through the locks in, in the new Charles Dam in Boston. And then uh, from that, the, the other um, dams upstream of Watertown, including Watertown upstream, have some sort of fish ladder fish way. And you may be wondering, you know, is there precedent for removing dams and looking at, you know, fish passage other than fish ladders in the Charles? And the answer is yes. Uh, uh, in Newton, wa Watertown line off of Bridge Street is the Bemis Dam, which is, you know, 244 years old. Um, it's it's breached here. You can kind of see here. Uh, it was breached in one of the hurricanes. I think it was the 1955 hurricane. Um and from that, uh, it was decided, in part from the Newton Conservation Commission and CRWA's efforts in the 70s, um, they advocated to not rebuild this dam uh, to allow for fish passage. So this is a success story. And you can kind of see some of the remnants of the dam there if you're off of Bridge Street, but fish can get right through here. And one warning, sometimes it can be a strong current for paddlers. Just be careful there. Um, the other dam that had some modifications was the bleachery dam. And this dam is in Waltham upstream of Bemis. And this was partially breached in the early 2000s. And that was a partnership with DCR, uh, Division Marine Fisheries and uh, CRWA. So they, they took out some sections of, of, of the dam. It was a lot lower than Watertown. Also wanna highlight um, more recently, up in Bellingham in the upper watershed, so a lot farther up than Watertown, obviously. Um, the Old Mill Dam was removed by the town in the state in, in 2017. And, you know, that, that really shows its precedent. And, you know, from colonization to today, there were 10 additional dams that had been removed or breached during storms um, that were never rebuilt. So th th there were some that sort of, you know, the, the factory went under, it was breached and they, they didn't even bother rebuilding it. So this, there are other ones too. Cool. And now I'm going to pass it off to my colleague, Lisa, to talk more specifically about the Watertown Dam and its history. 
Thanks so much, Robert. That was an awesome introduction. And I hope you all are kind of getting your heads around the whole dam situation, not only in the Charles River watershed, but statewide and all of the different considerations there are. So for Watertown Dam in particular, which I'm sure you are all very familiar with, um, this dam was, as Robert mentioned, um, used as a fish weir by the native people um, before colonization. And that was primarily because it was traditionally at the head of tide location. So when tides were still a thing in the Charles River um, before 1908, when the big dam um, was built at the end of the river, the, this was a natural elevation change area. It was an area where a lot of fish and other wildlife came. And um, Hartman, our, our um, partner from the Wampanoag tribe, has also said that people, indigenous people from surrounding states, as, as well as surrounding places in Massachusetts, would actually come here in order to fish in the spring um, because there was such a strong herring run at that time. Um, so in 1634 was the first time that colonists built a dam structure there, and that was for um, grist and then later paper mills. And in this is a fun tidbit, in 1738, um, Robert was mentioning that there were herring wardens in all of the towns up up in the um, along the Charles River. Well, they actually complained. Um, to the state about how the Watertown Dam was obstructing fish passage. So you could see even then there were clearly big reductions in the fish population that could get up to um, places in the watershed where they used to be able to get up to. Um, in the early 19, so this dam really switched ownership a lot of times through history. And by the early 1900s, it was no longer being used as a power source. Um, to fuel any mills. It transitioned into a passive dam. And then in 1966, at that point, the state owned the dam, um, DCR, what's now DCR, and it was rebuilt with the current concrete spillway that you'll see in place these days. And it was in 1972 that the current fish ladder was constructed. And I'll talk a little bit more about some of the problems with that too. Next slide. Great. So as I mentioned, DCR is the current owner of Watertown Dam. And the dam owners, any dam owner has certain responsibilities. They're required to pay for regular dam safety inspections every few years. Um, they have to com comply with the repair uh, recommendations of the Office of Dam Safety, which does those inspections. And they actually have to pay on their own for that maintenance. So this is a really big reason why we see folks, um, especially like private dam owners who inherit a dam that is serving no purpose, um, choose to remove the dam instead because it, it does um, negate that ongoing cost of keeping the dam there. Um, in, um, I'm sorry, one, I had one more thing to say on that one, Robert. <laughs> Sorry. Um, another reason that folks are deciding to go the dam removal route is because there is a lot of federal and state funding um, to support dam removal projects. Um, in Massachusetts, this is mainly done through the Division of Ecological Restoration. And there's also federal funding through NOAA. Um, and the, the Mass Dam and Seawall Repair Grants and Loans actually does a lot of dam removals as well, despite the name. And this is really, you know, a cost savings. There's a one cost uh, time that might be greater, but that's associated with the dam removal. And then there's no, there's no cost in the future to the dam owner. Thanks, Robert. You go ahead. So how did we get involved? What's the history of this project? Well, early, early in the 2000s, CRWA, um, started to stock American shad fry, which are coming out of that hose that you can see in this picture in the Lakes District, which is upstream of the Watertown Dam. And after that, 
the, the Division of Marine Fisheries and CRWA did monitoring at Watertown Dam to see how well those shad were doing coming back up and spawning in the river where they started out their lives. And what we found was that the alewife were mainly able to pass through the current fish ladder. So that's both the um, blueback and alewife herring. But the shad and especially the females, which are larger, could not pass through at all. And uh, about 80% of all of the fish that came up the river in the spring were predated downstream of the dam. Um, and so this prompted CRWA to look into dam removal as a potential rather than um, another method or, you know, obviously fixing the fish ladder could also be a solution, but for all the reasons that Robert explained earlier, that's not the best thing for re re um, restoring the whole ecosystem. So um, we applied for some funding to to initiate a feasibility study of dam removal through the D Division of Ecological Restoration. And it became a priority project in 2017. And the feasibility study was finally complete in 2021. Next slide. So just a little more information about those studies that, uh, that Division of Marine Fisheries and CRWA did. Um, we saw that about 300,000 river herring attempt to migrate up the river annually. That's how many actually got through the fish ladder. So there was a video camera installed at the end of the fish ladder in 2013 and 14. And that's how we got this estimate of 300,000. Um, and as you can see, um, that is not nearly a, as much as would historically have been there as Robert described as, you know, the, the whole river being black with fish and you could walk across it. Next slide. Uh, next slide. Thanks. Um, this is kind of a visual. So where the circle is on this picture is the entrance to the fish ladder. So we're looking from the south bank here at the spillway. And then that whole concrete on the left hand side of the picture is the fish ladder itself. And that circle is the opening to the fish ladder. So I liked how Robert described that as kind of getting getting your whole population down into a straw. So another big problem with the fish ladder itself is that it was actually built on the wrong side of the river. The deepest part of the channel is on the opposite side of the river. Thank you for showing that, Robert. And generally the fish swim upriver in the deepest part, and then they have to traverse all the way across in front of the spillway, which is very shallow and rocky and then find their way into that tiny pigeonhole of the fish ladder itself. And by the time that they do that, mostly they get predated by birds who are waiting there. I have I saw this spring, several herons and seagulls catch the fish right in their beaks really easily. It's a great place for bird watchers because it is uh, such a death pool for the fish. Um, and by the time that they do that whole traverse, if they get into the fish ladder itself, it then becomes a really um, hard exercise to actually leap up the rungs of the fish ladder and get all the way to the top. So it's really not a good system at all. So what did this feasibility study find? I'll go into a couple more of these details, but you can see these kind of major five highlights. First, it found that if the dam were to be removed, fish passage and spawning habitat would improve. Essentially, the impoundment that's created upstream of where the spillway is will be reduced in size, so the banks would come in and natural riffles would exist upstream of where the dam currently is, 
because um, because it's that head of tide location where there is a natural elevation change. So it wouldn't, instead of being a pool and then going down to riffles, it would really be riffles in like a longer sloping area. So you'd still get like that sound of water running over the rocks um, and but fish would be able to move up. And of course, all of the other great um, important uh, co-benefits as well of uh, improving the water quality and all of that. And then the next major barrier uh, to fish passage is at the Moody Street Dam, which is a dam that regulates um, floods and is operated currently. It does have a fish ladder and it's not clear how well that fish ladder is operating. So that's something that CRWA is working with the Division of Marine Fisheries to assess in the next few years. But once fish could make it past the Moody Street Dam, it opened, the river really opens up into the Lakes District, which is a massive area of, of habitat for fish uh, spawning. Um, another major finding, they did a hydrologic uh, model and found that flood storage would actually increase upstream of the dam and there's no flood risk downstream of the dam. Essentially what is downstream of the spillway would look exactly the same after dam removal. Um, but the, the upstream side, the impoundment would reduce in width by a couple feet and that would last about a half mile upstream of the spillway, which is around the area of Fort Forte Park. I'm not sure if I'm pronouncing that correctly, but you probably know where that is. Um, sediment is a major thing to consider whenever doing a dam removal because sediment accumulates behind dams and we, because of the history of contaminants getting into the environment because of our history of industrialization, um, that is a major concern. And this study found that about 1,700 cubic yards of sediment are contaminated and are mainly stored on the banks behind the spillway. And so if the dam were to be removed, that area would be exposed to daylight. And so that sediment would need to be removed and managed properly, meaning it would probably have to be disposed of offsite which can be very costly as a dam removal goes. Um, it also looked at some of the historical significance of the area and for all the reasons we've already talked about, they found that the area is historically significant and recommended that an archeological survey be done as part of um, the area that would be disturbed. So mainly upstream of the spillway. Um, and then their major conclusion is that the removal of the dam would improve overall ecosystem health and character and that it is feasible to remove the dam. And they also did an opinion of probable cost. This is a little dated because that was completed in 2021. And as we know, everything costs more now. But at that time, the cost estimate was around $2.1 million, which is really on par with a lot of other dams and even less expensive than a lot of dam removals in the area. Next slide. So just putting a little bit, some more graphics to what we've already talked about. Um, flooding is also a concern in this area. You can see this picture of the 2010 floods um, that's really exacerbated by the dam. And I didn't put a, a picture to it now, but droughts actually are very concerning as well. Um, last year in 2022, uh, the major drought that we had left the area just downstream of the spillway dried out because all of the water coming down the Charles was caught behind the spillway and barely any could get over it. And so that really fragmented the habitat even more than just the dam does itself. Um, but dam removal would solve both of those issues. Um, dam removal would provide for more flood storage capacity where the impoundment cur currently is and would approximately lower flood elevations by about six feet. And um, it would also solve the issue of 
the the low flow and fragmented habitat just downstream of um, the dam spillway during drought periods. Of course, droughts are a concern um, for many reasons. And as we've seen, like in the Ipswich, um, you can even get fragmented habitat when you have a continuous level of, um, or a continuous segment of stream, but the dam does make it worse. Next slide. And this is just a visualization of what that reduction in the impoundment area would be. So you can see right now, the limit of the 100 year floodplain is that red line, which is further out. And if the dam were to be removed, that would um, shrink in a bit and is that yellow line. And that's kind of an average of different, different flows throughout the year but all of this is part of the impoundment that's currently there. Um, and then this is a visual just to show where those contaminated sediments are really at. Um, the contaminants that were found were a lot of heavy metals, including cadmium, arsenic, uh, copper, chromium, zinc, and they were above the Mass Massachusetts safety thresholds, which means that they would have to be disposed of properly. There are also a lot of PAHs and other like hydrocarbon chemicals that were found in the sediment too. And again, this is not surprising and is pretty common, but is a costly item. But the total amount of sediment that would need to be removed, about 1,700 cubic yards, um, would is not is not a huge level or not a huge amount of sediment in the scheme of dam removals in Massachusetts. And the removal of these sediments is also really important because if there were a dam breach, if a tree fell on the spillway during a storm um, and sediment, the sand, sediment washed downstream, then you are moving those pollutants downstream and it has negative effects there as well. So it's really important to manage these sediments in a careful and thought out way. Next slide. And again, this is the full cost estimate. So you can see number six there is the highest item, um, which is remove and dispose of sediment along with the demolition. And then actually the water control number three, which uh, is always costly because it usually requires pumps and things like that, um, making sure that the river is still getting around where the management is happening. Next slide. Um, and then this is a beautiful rendering that we have um, of the dam removal. So again, this is looking at the dam from the south bank and you can see the fish ladder over on the left there. And uh, really what would be replaced, replacing the spillway is these riffles with rocks um, and flowing water that's, you know, bubbling and making a nice noise. It would still be a beautiful location um, for wildlife and with even more fish being able to make it through this area in time, um, that would attract even more wildlife and increase the overall biodiversity of the area. And I think with that, I'm going to turn it back to Robert to talk about some of our engagement on this project. Thank you, Lisa. Um, so yeah, we, we've had a really exciting, um, you know, groundswell of folks getting plugged into and engaged with uh, the story of the Watertown Dam and the really great opportunity to, to re restore the Charles River in such a highly visible location um, to help educate folks in the Watertown, Newton, and surrounding communities um, at, 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 you know, the opportunities of river restoration. You really don't get it very often to do it in such an urban area, in such a highly visible area. So um, we, where we've been, we, we've done a lot of outreach to folks including Newton conservators. And we're really excited to speak with you all tonight as well. But we've gotten support from um, over 11 nonprofit organizations and allies um, who are so very, really excited about um, the opportunity to restore the Charles River, including um, folks 
from American Rivers, Nature Conservancy, Sierra Club, um, and others, uh, Native Fish Coalition, Trout Unlimited. We have a lot of folks, a really big tent of of supporters. Um, also, we went and talked to folks up and down the river and got support from six municipalities. That's you know the conservation commissions, the um, you know sustainability committees, and, and also in Watertown, the uh, city council voted unanimously to support uh, this project, which was really exciting. Um, we met with with the city councilors in Watertown. And we've been doing site walks, uh, you know, talking to the media, webinars like this tonight, and meeting with a lot of the state legislators and folks about it. So really exciting. Um, and just to highlight that, we have some pictures of that engagement. And we, uh, this is us, this is with um, Senator Will Brownsberger and some of the staff members, Laurel from the city of Watertown and a bunch of residents from Watertown in the first um, church of Watertown. They, um, one of the people there wrote an amazing homily um, about the dam removal and river restoration. Uh, his picture from one of our cores, um, I think that was last year, I think, or the year before, I'm getting mixed up. Um, so we have had a lot of, a lot of tours and stuff. And recently, this was just on Tuesday. We had some really exciting developments, some breaking news. Um, <laughs> uh, we, we had the opportunity to um, have folks, including, um, as Beth mentioned, she was able to come to the tour, but we had a bunch of the supporters, the allies, um, and a bunch of city councilors to welcome the um, commissioner of DCR, Brian Arrigo, former mayor of Revere and... Um, I'm blanking on uh, Tom O'Shea, the commissioner of Fish and Game, um, at, at both under the uh, you know Governor Healy's administration, and it was amazing to get them down to talk about this exciting opportunity. They seemed excited. There was you know, there's no announcement. There's nothing formal, but you know th there was excitement. You know, and, and you know the, the city councilors. Um, here from Watertown, we're there, and I think of the next slide. Oh yeah, here's a picture, great picture. This is them. Uh, uh, a couple of, or four members of city councilors spoke about why they're excited about this project, why their constituents are excited about it, and um, we have a picture of Commissioner Rigo talking to to folks and se seeming excited. So it, it seems like we're heading in the right direction, and we're really excited for. Um, prospects of this project um i think i got some more pictures some more pictures from our walk we had some legislators there too and um i think a couple city councilors from newton too um so yeah very very exciting um developments and we're just going to continue to to you know share the message about this project um also um there are still some more technical questions um, that need to be answered. Obviously, no decision has been made by the dam owner DCR, uh, but there are, you know, looking, you know, further design, further analysis um, from, you know, building off the feasibility study is forthcoming and we're excited to be working with DCR to be doing that um, work. Also, we're gonna continue to engage folks at the cities and towns, um, including talking to you all tonight. Um, and also we're gonna be, be further engaging folks in Watertown being the host community. Um, in the spring, we're gonna be knocking on doors in the neighborhood. Um, so if, if you do live in, in, in the neighborhood, we'll, we'll, we'll come and say hello on a weekend. And we're really excited. We're gonna have a spring herring walk and celebration, which will be fun, do some art builds, um, we also did a, we had a Brandeis art project and we're going to continue to um, display that um, at our future events, um, which was a storytelling about, about the story of the river. Um, so that was really exciting. Um, and also, yeah, I mentioned the art build and, and, and the walks. So, so stay tuned. If, if, um, uh, if you're interested, you can sign up for our, our river current newsletter if you didn't already and we also have 
all of our events on our website, crwa.org forward slash events. Um, you just got some more pictures. Yeah, so this is another picture um, from the city council when we did our presentation before um, they did their resolution and just some pictures, myself and somebody from Native Fish Coalition and our executive director, Emily Norton, getting interviewed um, at a previous engagement with the media. And with that, just wanted to say thank you to everybody and for Newton Conservatives for having us. And we are really excited for all of your questions and, um, you know, have a discussion about this, but we're really excited about this project and thank you for coming. Thank you very much. My goodness, that's a lot to think about. And we have some questions for both of you. Um, let's start with a big picture view first. And uh, one of our questions is, in the process of dam removals, is it necessary to remove them sequentially? Do you need to stop start at the mouth of the river and then move upstream? Robert, why don't you take that one? I love that question. Um, I like to think of it as, you know, building a sidewalk, you know, you can, you, you start where you can um, and you can work one way or the other. Um, with the trial specifically, we're bookended by two dams that serve a purpose. So obviously the new Charles Dam um, between, you know, the North End and Charlestown it's not going to be removed. It's serving a purpose. But we're not, we're not going to drain the lower basin. So, but thinking about what in the other one um, up in uh, Hopkinton is a water supply. It's called Echo Dam in, in the headwaters of the Charles. So those who we're not going to remove. Also, Moody Street Dam is a flood control structure. We're not talking about removing that. Um, but Watertown is one of the one of the main ones we're focused on because it's at the head of tide and it's not serving a purpose. But thinking about the analogy with the um, uh, building the sidewalk, we, we have been in discussions with folks up in Natick and, the, and and they had a whole process and they've decided they're going to move their town-owned dam. So that's sort of like, okay, this we're building the sidewalk in Watertown, hopefully, in, in Natick too, they, they're moving forward. So um, in that section, there's a huge section of free flow river upstream of that. So. Yeah, it's it's coming at both angles. And and I know in other places they've done it similarly for passage. I don't know, Lisa, you want to add anything? Yeah, I mean, I would just say no, you don't have to go from one end to the next. A lot of um the dam removals, there's a big there was a big constant or um a big focus on dam removals on the Penobscot in Maine, and they did take that approach. Um that is generally an approach to take. Um, when it is possible, but a lot of the time, as Robert is saying, it's it's not possible. And the main the main reason for that is just getting more fish further up the river. But if the opportunity comes, like it has in Natick, um, where they really they had to repair the dam or remove it, and they they had to make the decision about that at that time because they were due for dam repair, and the town instead decided to remove it then that's the opportunity that they go with. So is is the Watertown Dam your the CWRA's top priority at this point? In terms of dam removals, yes. Mm -hmm. Terrific. That's nice. Uh, some questions going back into history, please. Uh, when the passive dam was created and it was rebuilt, why did they retain it? What was what was the thought behind it at that point? Great question. I can answer that. So that that was, I think it was Hurricane Diane in 1955. It, the um, the Watertown Dam breached. I actually talked to somebody at the Watertown Fair in the Square, and he remembered um, that wooden dam that was there. He said he would, he would play on it as kids. But that breached in, in that hurricane, and then it wasn't until 1966 when they rebuilt it and that, you know, the 50s, 60s, that was really the height, you know, thinking, you know, the context in America, that was the height of the dam building, you know, craze in, in America, um, especially in the West, but the dam rule really wasn't on 
a lot of people's minds. So it's sort of like, oh, damn, damn broke. We, gotta, we have to fix it, you know? So I think that's sort of why it was done. It was not really thought about, okay, maybe we, we could remove it. Um, so yeah, and it was mainly, so that was the idea, you know, thinking about, um, you know, getting something back there. I think it's sort of the context of the times. Fascinating. Uh, the sediment that you were talking about, it has to be taken off site. Where is it taken? Yeah, so that is definitely a question. And I've actually been following the um, the huge dredging project that's been ongoing for several years now at the Muddy River, um, which is way more sediment than we're talking about here. Um, and it does have to go to landfills. And there are different states where the landfills are open for different levels of um, contamination. And that is outside of Massachusetts. Um, so that is generally the approach that's taken when sediment needs to be removed off site. I've seen a couple of dam removals have actually done sediment management on the site. Um, and it really depends if it's that lower level of the contamination it could be incorporated to the restoration and then capped on site, um, but that's a little bit less preferred just because there, there are um, you know, concerns about that leaching into the river again. So are there communities that say, sure, for the money, we'll take your bad soil, <coughs> your sediment, and they bury it there? I mean, how, how does that get worked out? That's my understanding is that there are still open landfills out, outside of Massachusetts um, that take different levels of hazardous sediment. Yeah. Fascinating. Uh, we have a lot of concern. I, I want to tell people, if you want to make sure that I see your questions, please put them in the Q&A and not the chat. Can't monitor two at the same time very well. My, my bad. Um, we have a lot of concern with the water levels here. Um, and there seems to be sort of uh, some contradictory worries. Uh, one person is saying, uh, will, the, will it increase flood risk? Another person is saying, uh, if the water level will go down significantly upstream. Another person asked, what is it going to do to the Lakes District in Auburndale? Um, is it going to make that much shallower and narrower? Yeah, I can address those questions. So there's a couple different areas that I think maybe people are addressing. So one thing when people see dam removal, they think of this big wave of water coming down and there being flooding downstream of the dam. And that's actually what we're trying to avoid with dam removal. That is what happens when a dam is breached during a storm. And that is what the flood risk comes from that is associated with this current state of this dam. Downstream of the dam, if the dam were to be removed, the water would be rerouted properly at a pace that would be like, um, you know, basically like the river was flowing normally. So downstream of the dam, there would be no flooding impacts. Upstream of the dam, the water level would be reduced and it would be kind of narrowed on the banks by, I think, I think it's like 10 feet on each side. So we're not talking a huge amount of narrowing and that narrowing would only last half a mile upstream of the current spillway, which is around the area of Forte Park. So it's not, not even all the way to Bridge Street. That is the last area that would be affected, the, where water levels would be affected by this dam removal at all. Way, going any further upstream than that and up into the Lakes District, water levels would not be affected. And the Lakes District water level is only set by the Moody Street Dam, which is regulated when storms are coming in or not. Um, and that's done, managed properly by DCR. But anything beyond that half mile upstream of the spillway, no other water levels would be changed by the dam removal. Okay. And the Moody Street Dam, you said, is functional. That's correct. It's 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 regulated um, as a flood control dam by DCR. Okay. They so draw it down before or they allow for uh, flood storage during storms. So we had a question. There's no chance of that being removed. That's that's, that's correct. Okay. Off Terrific. <laughs> 
great. I have a question. My, too bad my husband isn't here. He keeps asking me about this proposed ferry service. And we have a question about it. It said, <laughs> this increase the length of the potential ferry service being proposed from Watertown to Boston? I don't think so, because um, really the the first navigable area, I don't know exactly what boat they're they're proposing to use, but the area that we're talking about of Watertown dam being removed, it would be very shallow. It might be passable by kayak, but it would not be passable by any other, um, you know, boat. <laughs> yeah, and I could I could clarify that too um, for everybody. Currently, it's not navigable by boat below the dam because it's the head of tide, the natural change in elevation that we were talking about. Um, like historically, they called it the Watertown Falls, um, part of why it's called Watertown. So that area, because the, the tide used to come all the way up to Watertown Square by Galen Street downstream, that's where the basin is, the lower basin, which is like a like a reservoir. So upstream of that Galen Street, you couldn't get a powerboat today. If you remove the dam, you couldn't get the powerboat up to the dam today. You couldn't get a powerboat boat up if the dam was gone. So I would say no, but it wouldn't it wouldn't change in, in that regard. You know what I mean? So, yeah, right. We we have another question. Have there been any proposals for adjusting the river channel below the dams to make the flow better for the fish, directing them to fish ladders? haven't heard those proposals. Okay. It's a request. It was saying, have there been any? I don't believe so. Yeah, okay. I don't think so. And I think what Larry's referring to is sort of like a rock ramp or that sort of thing. Um, I've seen that in some other areas. Um, my understanding is that because the water tending is pretty high, it's not, you'd have to bring a lot of stone and it may not even be permittable. Um, and it wouldn't solve the water quality upstream of the dam. Um, and, and we also, like, I know people have asked, like, what about doing a, a new fish ladder? The cost associated with that is very similar to, if you did it right, it'd be very similar to just taking out the dam. So at that point, so, like, let's just take out the dam and you get all the water quality benefits. Okay. And that $2 million you say you think would primarily come from federal agencies would I mean. Yeah. So um, the funding sources are definitely could be from several different places. Um, a lot of money is coming down through uh, the federal government right now from the bipartisan infrastructure law, as well um, as more that are that are coming through Congress. And that is opening up a lot of funds. And NOAA has some open funds right now, actually, that are specifically for barrier removal on streams. And um, if this project were further along at this moment, we would definitely be putting in for that. But that funds projects that are between $1 million and $25 million, and they have you know, hundreds of million dollars open for, for the nation for that. And this one would be pretty um, competitive as it is, you know, on a historic river, first major barrier to fish, fish passage. So how long do you think it will be before you get to that point? <laughs> well, I think, I don't know, Robert, do you want to answer that? <laughs> uh, or I can, before, I can take a step. construction. Well, to go to uh, to apply for one of these grants, it's I mean it's dependent on DCR, honestly. Yeah. Um, like we we could we could go sooner, but they they're they're honestly leaving money on the table. To be frank, um, um, and if they, I mean this the pro, I, mean, I don't know if we mentioned, but this project this has been talked about for like twenty years, and all these projects take a long time. But yeah, um, I'd say that. I, yeah. Yeah. But, in, but right. for, for permitting, it's usually like a few years for permitting. Um, so right start. now there is funding um, secured through uh, a, the state legislator, legislature for um, further feasibility to answer those kind of last questions, which are really more like a sediment management plan, um, an updated cost estimate since costs have changed so much as well as design um, for the dam removal. 
And then, uh, so I would anticipate those questions if they if they were to be answered in, or if DCR agreed to have those answered in the next six months, I would assume that that process would take about a year or two. Um, and then you would have to go through more final designs and permitting and the permitting stage can take a long time and probably will for this. I would anticipate that being three to five years. And then I would say construction would be more feasible. Okay, so we're talking about uh, some number of years yet, but let's say we all say right now, okay, we need to help you get this done. What can supporters do that would be helpful? I'll take, Robert can take that one. Yeah, I would say number one, let your friends know, let your family members know, talk about it in the grocery store, talk about it, you know, at church or wherever you're going, you know, let people know about this project um, and, and how it's a really exciting transformational um, opportunity in this, in this, you know, time of climate change. So it's really an inspiring project and the time is really right. So I think that's number one, talk to people, talk to your um, uh, legislators uh, at the state house, um, state rep, state senators about it. Um Talk if you know people at DCR. Talk to them. Let people know. But definitely, we're, we're trying to get the word out. Come to events. Um, you know, we are um, nonprofit organizations. So if you're interested in supporting us financially, too, send a donation. So yeah, there's all different ways. But definitely, number one is letting people know because um, getting the word out. Because once people sort of get get the story, they're like, okay, what are we waiting on this? You know. So I think that's sort of the number one thing is just letting people know. Um, and we will let people know when there's more specific uh, asks if, if sort of there's something happening that's going to influence DCR coming down the pipeline or the state um, at that point. But yeah, definitely talk about so it. So right <laughs> now, what is our specific ask of our state legislators? Are we asking them to talk to DCR? Are we... Okay, so that's all the whole conversation at this point is aimed at persuading DCR to move. Yeah, yes. and just say, you know, I'm you know, I'm a constituent, I'm very excited about this project, and I you know, we heard about it and we love your, you know, we love your support and and whatever you can do to support the project. Like that's that's really how it comes down. And just letting people know, because like I said, people learn things through people you know i mean the social media too but uh, but definitely the one on one connections is really is so important and i did just put in case folks are not signed up right now um we have an advocacy center on our website and this is one of the priorities for our advocacy um and so you can sign up to get our action alert emails um if there are times that writing to your legislators, for example, or other actions will be especially impactful. Okay, people can't see the chat, but the day oh. after, but it's okay. It's okay because the day after uh, we have a webinar, I always send out a message. So okay. I will send that information and the message goes that goes out tomorrow. And if you think of other things I should be sure to include, please let me know those. Uh, as well. Now we have another question that just came in and I've got a couple before to go back. You, before you ask that question, I did post it in the chat. Oh, you did. Oh, thank you. But can and people can see it, Barbara? Yes, they can. Okay. I'll also just ask Barbara if you can post, I'll, I'll chat it here, but um, really share and take a look at our river interrupted story map. It's a fantastic piece of work that explains all of this. Terrific. Uh, we do have a couple questions here about what are the what reasons would people object to this? What are the opposing views? We just got two of those, one after another, right now. Great question. You want to take that, Robert? Yeah. Um, what what we've been hearing a lot of it is, uh, and it's not it's not very loud, honestly. Um, some of the other projects is a lot, you know, a lot more opposing. Uh, I think people get the story, um, but what what we've been hearing a lot is number one is concern about aesthetic changes. People like, I mean, I like I like a spillway, or people call it the waterfall, but essentially where the dam water is coming over the dam like this, you know. Um, and what what 
you know, what I, you know, what, what we've been talking about is there's still going to, it's not going to be the same, you know, there's going to be change, but there's still that natural change in elevation. There's still going to be the sound of water flowing over rocks, the set, you know, the, the visual of that, it's going to be different. I think, I think I've, I've been to dam removal sites. Like there's one up in Exeter, which is kind of a similar topography. Um, and it can be beautiful. You know, I, I find free, personally, I find free flowing rivers beautiful, but that's, that's one, the major thing we've heard from folks. Um, the other thing is some people are concerned about wildlife and um, have concerns that the dam is, you know, pr protecting wildlife because it's been there 200 years. But I think once we talk about how the fish and the, the birds and the wildlife evolved over thousands of years, you know, um, that sort of allays that fears. But I think that's the other thing we've heard. And it's a very common thing um, for all dam removal projects that people are like, well, the, the pond's been here forever. Um, but it, it's, it's, um, yeah, a lot of, and when you hear from the ecologists and, and the ex, you know, science folks, it's really not a big issue. It's, it's actually going to really help the birds because they're going to have more fish to eat. So yeah, that's those are the two um, that I've heard. The other, the other one I've heard is that some in the boating community downstream are a little concerned about sediment and is it going to, you know, create a big sandbar. Lisa kind of answered this, but I don't think it's going to be that that much but this going to be more analysis on that i don't know if you have yeah anything so there. that's one of the unanswered questions um still also because watertown yacht club newton yacht club and cri are in that kind of sunset bay area where the river does widen um you do get a lot of sediment deposition in that area and the river has been filling in just from um you know runoff from our outfalls and all of the sediment that comes off of our streets and from our homes and that's been filling in over years which is getting tricky for boats to come in and out of those those yacht clubs and so there is concern that the sediment that wouldn't have to be removed um, because it's contaminated that sediment will be passed down river um, naturally which is a common part of dam removals as well but concern that that would exacerbate the problems that they're already having and so um, that would be part of, you know, creating the sediment management plan and really understanding better, would that settle in that area? And if so, what are ways that we can mitigate those effects? I've also heard some birders who actually really like the way the fish get jammed up there and they because they can see the birds really well. But it seems to me that knowing that it would be for the benefit of the birds more overall in the long run, that 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 could persuade them to give up that little bit of joy of watching them all crowd in right yeah, there. Yeah, I mean, yeah. it's a major landscape change. And I think people's gut reaction to a major change like this is just like, well, why does it have to be that way? Why why would this be better than this, what they perceive as, as a beautiful landscape? And it is a beautiful landscape. Um, but then when I think it just takes a kind of education and and understanding it in a different way and thinking about a longer term than even just, you know, 20 years that someone has lived in, in the area and, and grown an attachment to that landscape. But thinking about what it could be for your, for your future, for your kids and your grandkids, I mean, that's what really inspires me to keep going. Um, and thinking about the possibilities of what that could be um, are really vast. Oh, the other thing on that too that it reminded me of um with the birds is that um we do have a great support from Mass Audubon. Um uh, they they are they have done projects removing dams, they have a restoration team working looking at stuff at their sanctuaries, and they're very supportive of this project too. Um but also because it's the natural change in elevation, we still think some of the birds will be there, obviously not the same numbers, but also you still got you know, the Moody Street Dam, you got other places where they, you'll be able to see them congregate. So it's not all okay. lost. They may, they move, they're going to move, but. <laughs> <laughs> I have one last really small question, but I have to ask, when you showed the, the signs for the drowning dam, 
uh, and and the circular uh, uh, people getting caught in it. Is the Watertown Dam one of those dams? Yes, it is. And I don't, I, I haven't found any specific for Watertown, but other dams on the Charles people have drowned and there's been instances. Oh. And the, one of the pictures I took was from the um, Mother Brook in Dedham where the where the Charles flows into the Mother Brook, which goes into the Ponset River. So that some of the signs were from that. One, the, the other sign was from the Mother Brook. So I try to get signage from near the area um, to show it. But yeah, a lot of those dams, low head, that's why Moody Street has the buoys. Yeah. Um, it's kind of surprising some of the dams don't have them. But um, yeah, it is one. At certain flows, you want to stay away from going over it. <laughs> well, thank you. As Adrian says here in the Q&A, thank you very much that you taught us a lot. It was amazing. And clearly, we're going to have to have an ongoing conversation. It's important that we'll, we keep talking. So thank you. If people have other questions, uh, you can submit them to them at webinars at newtonconservators.org, and I will make sure that they get passed on to them. We really thank you for joining us tonight. And most of all, thank you very much, Robert and Lisa. Thank you so much. And good night, everyone. <laughs>